This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome everyone, this is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. The website is offplanetradio.com. And uh, that site's kind of still under construction. We're rebuilding in the background. So if it looks a little dated, we're trying to update it uh, next few months. I think it'll be worthwhile. Um, those of you who have followed the show for a long time know that I'm a huge fan of what's called C60, Carbon 60, the uh, Bucky Balls. And I have exciting news today. We're going to delve deep into the subject of C60, a little bit about its past, a little bit about its present, and hopefully a lot about its future because it's a product that is indeed evolving, as you're about to find out. Uh, a little background on the Buckyballs and the C60. Uh, pretty interesting that uh, this all emanates out of technology and is named after our Buckminster Fuller, um, one of my heroes. Uh, old story, uh, back in the 70s, as a student, I built a geodesic dome with a group of people and learned a lot about the philosophy and background of our Buckminster Fuller. And uh, so when I found out about Buckyballs, I'm like, there's synchronicity here. Uh, Bucky's been following me pretty much most of my life. And I think that there's like a kind of spirit that goes through all of this as well. So the whole idea of the Buckyballs, the C60, has an interesting story. In 1985, Rice University chemist Robert Curl and Richard Smalling hosted British chemist Harry Croto for a series of experiments in Houston. Croto had a theory about how long carbon chains were formed in the atmospheres of carbon-rich giant stars. And Smalley had built a laser beam apparatus that could vaporize molecules and test the theory. So over 10 days, the three professors and three graduate students conducted tests in which they vaporized carbon molecules with Smalley's laser beam apparatus and then measured the carbon atoms clustered together. To their surprise, in addition to the long chain molecules they were seeking, they found a high number of clusters consisting of 60, yep, count them, 60 carbon atoms. The professors tasked their graduate students with finding ways of changing the parameters of the experiment to increase the number of C60 molecules and tried to theorize what their structure would look like. They knew the structure had to be something more stable, like a sphere that would protect the bonds between the carbon atoms from being easily broken. What was the chemical structure, Curly recalled in Rice office earlier this month? This article is from cron.com 2016, just to put a date on it. So he's asking, what was the chemical structure? How do you put 60 carbon atoms together and come up with something really stable? Curto remembered that he had built with his children, a paper star dome that consisted of both pentagons and hexagons. He wanted to call his wife in England to have her find the construction. Curly goes on to add, but it was probably getting late and highly improbable we had done this. Instead that night, Smalley fiddled with paper, scissors, and scotch tape, creating a paper sphere made up of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. Those numbers are interesting, with 60 corners. It fit all the parameters for a stable form of carbon with 60 atoms. The structure resembled the geodesic domes that American architect Buckminster Fuller designed for the 1967 Montreal World Exposition. They decided to name the structure Buckminster Fullerene in his honor. They called the spheres buckyballs for short because they resembled soccer balls. The trio was excited about what they came up with, but it was only a theory. They had no proof other than the high number of C60 molecules that they were seeing in their experiments, but that didn't deter them. They woke up 
They wrote up their findings and hypothesis over the next few days and submitted it to a publication, the prestigious journal Nature. The journal editor wrote back expressing skepticism that they had found anything significant, underscoring the highly speculative nature of their article, but it was nonetheless accepted for publication. We were all very excited, Curly Curl recalls. Some of my colleagues uttered the word Nobel Prize, but I knew that wasn't going to happen. When the publication hit in November 1985, it created a firestorm in the scientific community. Many didn't believe the chemists had truly found a new structure for carbon. Scores of scientists began to experiment with carbon clusters and soon found they could create an almost infinite variety of carbon structures, and within a few years, their theory was proved correct. For the first time, scientists could, could manipulate elements at the simplest level, building from the atomic level up. That's really an important concept. These different hollow closed shell carbon structures came to be known as fullerenes. The discovery showed the carbon, which had been previously thought to exist only in a handful of stable structures, such as diamonds or graphite, could have an almost infinite number of structures. This was a singular event in the history of nanotechnology, said Neil Lane, senior editor, senior fellow in science and technology at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy several years ago. It not only created a whole new field of fullerene chemistry, it immediately made feasible the notion of making things from the bottom up. Buckyballs turned out to have little practical use. Well, we'll park that for a moment. Yeah. But their discovery opened the door to the entire field of nanotechnology, including the 1991 discovery of carbon nanotubes in Japan. These tubes, like the buckyballs, stretch to form long tubes that are excellent conductors of heat and electricity with great tensile strength. <clears throat> By the mid-1980s, it was clear the C60 discovery was worthy of a Nobel in chemistry. But the, com the committee had to decide who would receive the Nobel Prize because the rules state that only three individuals can be awarded a single prize. So the committee decided, had to decide between the Rice researchers or a German team that discovered a simpler, more efficient way to make C60. In 1996, Curl, Croto, and Smalley were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Rice graduate students James Heath, Sean O'Brien, and Juan Lee were left out of the mix. And that's a piece of history of Carbon 60. So that gives you the background for it. And joining me today to introduce the new concepts in the future of C60 is Chris Burris, who's an, a mechanical engineer turned scientist and entrepreneur and co-owner of the newest C60 company, C60 Evo. Using no pri Nobel Prize winning chemistry tested by NASA, that has been shown to double the lifespan of mammals. Chris has gone on a mission to make C60 a household name, help people feel healthier, live longer, and pain-free lives for many years. His parent company, SES, has produced most of the raw C60 sold in America since 1961. Co-owners, scientists, Chris Burrow, Chris Burris and Robert Wong invented the only reactor machine of its kind to produce carbon-60 and other carbon modules when they were in college. The demand and awareness has grown exponentially, and now 28 years later, they're still producing C60 because it works. The evolution of C60 had to happen where a new standard has been set to guarantee purity and quality to the consumers. So they opened C60 Evo and sell direct to the public now with a guarantee that it is safe C60 for human consumption. The manufacturing process is exceptional. It's done in a clean lab. Their C60 goes through a vacuum oven dry and wash process and they test the batches regularly to match the purity with what the bottle claims. This is rare in the C60 world. They spin their powder and oil for three weeks in large kettles that are airtight without oxidation or sonication, i.e. heat. This also is rare in the C60 world. Let's talk about the future of C60. Welcome to Off Planet Radio and TV, Chris Burris of Evo C60. 
Hello, Randy. So thank you for that, that great introduction. Uh, yeah, here to talk about kind of the evolution of C60. Uh, and, and also, you, you know, I hadn't heard that story. I remember reading that article and I hadn't heard it in a, in a while. And if you wanted to start there, I can interject a few things that are debatable. <laughs> yeah, well, I told you before we went on, I, pro I suspect because of the nature of the internet and the way information travels, it's some things there probably need to be clarified and I figured you probably could do it. Yeah, so, um, so, so I, like the whole premise is true and there's just little kind of nuances that I think really, really add to the story, right? So the first one is that Richard Smalley had this piece of equipment Harold Croto was, uh, was really the one kind of driving because he's trying to understand what was happening, what these spectrums were in space, theorizing that they were a carbon and actually approached uh, Dr. Smalley and his team uh, three times. It was a third time that anything finally happened. But each time he was like, hey, let's throw some carbon in this amazing piece of equipment that you've made uh, and let's see what happens. And, and Dr. Smalley was like, no, I'm doing really sexy materials like titanium and silver and, and all of these other materials. So I really don't have time to put your, you know, to put your boring old carbon in my, in my very fancy and expensive machine. Um, and it was actually on the third time that Heath, uh, as you mentioned, who was kind of left out of the Nobel Prize, pulled Kodo aside and said, look, I was going to come in this weekend. I'll throw some carbon in there and we'll see what we can do. And, and in that article that you read, it talked about spending a number of days and that that probably happened. But what happened first is Heath noticed this unique peak. Now, as you're reading that article, if you're kind of not aware of what's going on, you're like, okay, a peak at 60, it's the monkey ball, okay, whatever. But, but when you think about the logic behind it, and when you also realize that one year prior, our IBM had the exact same data, but IBM said, oh, this is just an anomaly, it's nothing worth investigating. Heath, on his own, on that weekend, adjusted the equipment to enhance the peaks, right? Mm -hmm. And what are those peaks? What do those peaks really mean? So if you think about what wasn't a peak in that particular graph, all it was was carbon sheets. So if you think about carbon sheets and one of them has 16 carbon atoms and another one has 17 or 18, and then we're looking at 59, 60, and then 61, except there's a whole lot more quote unquote sheets of 60 versus 59 and 61 and of course the rest of them. And again, IBM looked at that data and said, oh, that's an anomaly. Heath looked at that data and goes, well, that doesn't really, I, at least I got to bring it to my professors uh, that following Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. So he brought it to them and, and, and the professors, you know, collectively as a team kind of identified, well, it doesn't make sense. Like 60, you know, carbon sheets of 60 carbon atoms doesn't make sense when you compare it to 59 or 61. Like there's no reason that that should be normal. It had to, yeah, it had to be some sort of cage. And in fact, it was, you know, it turned out to be uh, that buckyball cage. Uh, and, and the other thing that is potentially lost in there, they did win the Nobel Prize. They won it in 11 short years. They actually did have a lot of practical applications pretty quickly. The, the reason that they couldn't use them was more on the engineering side, more on the cost side, right? Because engineering is science and math. I mean, science and dollars, really. Um, it was more on the cost side. If it's so expensive, I, I always have said C60 performs as well or better than the current best material in almost every application. It's really an amazing, amazing molecule. Um, but it's so expensive. It's better in paints. It's better in tires. It's better in solar cells. It's, it's, it, we think that it's going to replace lithium and battery cells. So it has all these amazing uh, applications, uh, but it's, it's just too expensive. And in fact, when that article was written that you just read, it was selling for $6,000 a gram. Wow. Yeah, thousand dollars, <laughs> and that's that, that's really why we started the original company. My business partner Robert was uh, working uh, at, on the University of Houston, so really close to the Rice University campus. Mm -hmm. He was working in uh, with Dr. Paul Chu, who's uh, who was in charge of the Institute Superconductivity Institute, all right there at the U of H campus, and he was separating these fullerenes, right? So we talked about this whole gamut of molecules. C sixty is the most abundant, looks like a soccer ball. C70 is a little more um, rugby ball shaped and then the rest continue to get bigger and really more round, more sy symmetrical. 
So he was separating these materials today with a process that we, we fundamentally we use today, different, different chemicals, different uh, uh, a medium, but using a chromatography process. And his professor, Dr. Chu, walked in one day and was like, this, is, this material is $6,000 a gram. Like, you guys are young kids. You should go start a company and you know, manufacture and sell this. And my business partner, Robert Wong, is from an entrepreneurial background, and he was like, yes, I should. And so he did. I was studying mechanical engineering. There's a whole lot of you know, mechanical components in that original piece of equipment that we made. A lot of um, uh, heat transfer, all of these things that were, that were necessary to make this piece of equipment right. We actually uh, brainstormed with Dr. Smalley's grad students to identify some of the ways that we could make our first machine better. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's when we kicked off that that first company. And we're the first company to deliver commercial quantities of carbon nanomaterials that still exists. Like one company beat us, but they well, they really only made it about six months. So. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't viable otherwise. So you basically won in the long run by being better business people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thrifty, the thriftiest business people on the planet for a long time, for sure. So we take this material from its inception into the industrial applications of it. Um, how did the fullerene, these hollow nanotube fibers, how did they play into development just in you know, short, how did they develop into new materials, uh, so, into material science? Yeah, so um, really another, like, so So a lot of, uh, you know, back in, in the 90s, uh, a lot of friends and family would ask me what I do, and I'd say, you know, carbon nanomaterials, I'd say, well, what's that good for? And the running joke at the time was uh, that fullerenes are really good for funding, right? It won the Nobel Prize in 96, right? That's a really short time to, I don't, I don't know if you kind of know stats, but the, that's a really short time uh, on, on winning a Nobel Prize. Typically, it's like 30, 40, 50 years yeah, later. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, hey, remember that thing you discovered a long time ago that nobody recognized? We now realize it's really important. So to win it in 11 years was just a testament. And really, it makes perfect sense because because they, they figured that the buckyball was going to be very similar. It was going to be a 3D version of benzene, right? Benzene is ubiquitous. It's carcinogenic and toxic, yeah. but it's ubiquitous. It's in plastics. It's in, uh, in most medicines. So for modern society, it doesn't exist without you know, this flat benzene ring, right? And mm -hmm. then you say, well, here's a 3D version of it. Like, what are the implications? And the implications are Nobel Prize worthy, right? So they, all sorts of scientists were putting them in different applications uh, early on. And it, there's actually a new symbol in chemistry because of the buckyball, right? So prior to the buckyball, the at symbol, that's the one we use in our email addresses, yeah. was not a chemical symbol at all. Now that's a symbol. If you see uh, lanthanum at C60, what you have is lanthanum physically trapped inside of that C60 cage. Um, it's not ionically bonded with it. It's not co covalently bonded. It's physically trapped. So early on, scientists were like, wow, this might be a great mechanism. We know how to work with benzene. We know how to get like benzene to attach to cancer cells, right, by making attachments to the external benzene. What if we trapped some radioactive material inside of this buckyball and then had it attached to cancer cells? Like this is some pretty amazing nanotechnology stuff. And, uh, and so they had those theories. Now that's really expensive and really, I mean, the, the, they're small, right? They're, they're about 10 angstroms across. They're, they're, uh, it's only 60 carbon atoms. Most of the I time don't think can, most people can fathom an angstrom. So yeah, it, uh, it, it's really hard. Uh, I'll, I'll have to, I need a to human up, hair I, in terms of the, maybe the, the thickness of a human hair. What is an angstrom? It's gotta be I need to come up with a really good representation of it. It's gotta be thousands. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's hard to fathom, right? You pull your hair out and you look at it and think, okay, yeah. there's a thousand buckyballs going across the diameter of your hair. Right. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. So, so, one of the things that became pretty clear because it's expensive, because it's actually the, the natural way to make it um, is, is, is basically to vaporize two graphite rods when you, and you, and you make a, a soot and that soot has about 10%. I won't get too much into like that manufacturing process, but the natural way to kind of make more of it, right? Cause you don't want small quantities. You want big quantities is to like do it with a bigger rod, right? So you go up mm -hmm. to a one inch rod, you go up to 
what happens as you increase the dimer uh, rod, you're changing the manufacturing um, environments on, uh, you can imagine on a nano scale. Mm -hmm. And so your yields go down. So it's not a material that lends itself to like mass production. Scale. Scale, yeah. exactly. And so uh, it was understood pretty early, like the real opportunities here are potentially medical, but it would have to be in a situation where you didn't need much or defense, right? Because at, at the end of the day, the defense or NASA, they don't, the cost doesn't matter. It's the value the material is bringing to the project that really matters. And so this, you know, amazing molecule. So we knew those two things. And really we were kind of petering along as an industry, selling to research institutions around the world. And then in 2012 comes this, this just amazing, uh, they actually did a toxicity study. Again, if benzene is everywhere, there's lots of toxicity studies on benzene. We know it's toxic. We know it's mm -hmm. carcinogenic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if yeah, right. If we're going to do, if we're going to take this buckyball and we're going to use it as much as we use the benzene ring, then we got to do those same toxicity studies. So the first real big one, I mean, there's a number of them, but the first real big one was uh, out of Paris, uh, out of University of Paris, obviously in France, um, in 2012. And in that particular case, they gave rats olive oil, rats, uh, well, water was the control group, olive oil, and then olive oil with what we call ESS-60. So this is the evolution of C60 is really kind of contingent on this little piece because it turns out that C60 when it's improperly processed or modified, right? They've tried to make it water soluble. We can talk about that in a little bit, but when they process it incorrectly, it's actually, there's plenty of literature that shows it to be harmful to you. When you take C60 and you process it properly, that's called ESS60 and that's processed for safer human consumption. So we go back to the rats, we gave them water, we gave them olive oil, and we gave them olive oil with ESS-60. And it turns out that it wasn't toxic. Uh, in fact, the rats given olive oil with ESS-60, which is the C60 EVO formulation, uh, they lived 90% longer. Um, and 90%, like, okay, that sounds like a lot. Uh, if I just give you the stat that the average human, if they lived 90% longer, they'd live to 152. The average human, right? Not the oldest human, but the mm -hmm. average one would live there. Not only did these rats live 90% longer, a typical Worcester rat dies at 32 months. These rats died at 62 months on average, and they had no tumors. Typical Worcester rats and all of the controls in this group were kind of bred this way, had tumors, all of them. None of the ones given the C60 EVO formulation had tumors, even though they lived, you know, they had twice the opportunity for tumor growth. It that's was, that 2012 study that's kind of blown everybody's mind. Yeah, and I mean, if you think about it now, how ubiquitous cancer really is, um, you know, I, I have a brother who's a doctor who's told me everybody basically has cancer. It was simply a matter of whether it manifests or not, whether... Yeah the tumors become viable and begin to outstrip healthy cell, cell growth. So it's everywhere. And when yeah. you look at that study and you realize you've increased the lifespan of a creature, while at the same time almost eliminating the one thing that is most likely to kill them, that's, that's, if you put that on a graph, that's a pretty stunning. Yeah. Yeah, because with time, tumors are supposed to increase, yes. right? And we extended time beyond a normal life and there were no tumors. It's, it's real. I'm listening to a book. I don't know if you, I listened to, um, audible, audible. And got a, a whole series called great courses, right? Yes. And I'm yes. listening to one that's really interesting about kind of assessing how the media reports medical science. And it's kind of cool because right. It's given media a hard time, yeah. not surprisingly. And one of the things that it talks about is, you know, PSA tests and also um, mammograms, like, are these really good tests? Because from a scientific perspective, like, we tend to approach these things from a very, not surprising, human and emotional perspective, right? Like, if I can catch it, and I know it's there, I need to get rid of it. But the medical science behind it says, you're right, we've got cancers in us and we have some aggressive cancers. We got some cancers that really are just really super lazy and are never going to do anything. And some of these tests identify those lazier cancers and then cause us to take action against something that was never going to be a problem. Right. And that's, I don't know, I've just been listening to that recently. Uh, last well, not only that, but I'll just point out that we know that mammograms themselves are problematic, that 
In fact, they increase the risk themselves of cancer. Yeah. As do, you know, this is where you get into, um, you know, medical science and allopathic medicine and how it operates on certain levels in a very invasive way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it, by the way, I recommend that course. It's 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 pretty uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, it's a bit long. <laughs> Those great courses tend to be, and I'm kind of tired of him ranting, uh, uh, ragging, <laughs> and it's, uh, ragging on the media. But it's you know it's it's good stuff, and it's all like he's a, a, a physician, and he's just like breaking down. It's interesting because like they'll take the two different news organizations will take the exact same study and one will report, look, positive effects of what's, and the other one was like, it couldn't be more negative. <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of discerning people are writing these news, uh, these news articles? Well, let's face it, if they're going to butcher anything, it's going to be politics or medicine. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in that in that story as well, you you heard that little interesting insert where they talked about C60 didn't really have any practical applications. Yeah, that's why I brought up. I was like, well, that's yeah. they kind of knew it would, uh, but uh, but maybe that was so early on they you know whatever. What's the definition of practical? So there were theoretical ones for sure. The early development, obviously, as you pointed out, was in the defense industry. Where does NASA come into this equation? So, so um, I get this question uh, from time to time, you know, what is NASA's involvement? Um, and we've actually, NASA has a thing, has an event every year called NASA Days. It's actually where people who are contractors for NASA and people who are interested in kind of what's going on at NASA from a, a business opportunity and a techn technology opportunity space can go down, you get a tour of NASA and their booths set up where different vendors who are, who are selling into NASA are kind of showing what they're selling into NASA. So we've been to those. NASA's, you know, it's, again, superconductive. It's harder than a diamond. Um, the, the nanotubes especially have a lot of applications. Um, you mentioned that in, in that article, it mentioned that nanotubes are conductive. What's really interesting about nanotubes is different diameters and chiralities of nanotubes uh, will oscillate between conductive and insulative, right? So you can actually yeah. create, you know, two diameters that are bundled into each other and you can literally make a wire that's- Two different that. properties. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not only that, what's, what's amazing about nanotubes is nanotubes are the strongest material in tension that man will ever see. And we know that because the carbon-carbon double bond is the strongest chemical bond. Now we're talking about one molecule where the strength of the bond, where the strength of the molecule is the carbon-carbon double bond. And so it literally is the strongest material that we will ever see. Uh, and there's talk of, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the, of the, the I think it's the space tether elevator. Mm -hmm. So basically, mm -hmm. just like when you swing a coin on a, on a string, if you put a big weight, out in space like a big satellite the earth is spinning fast enough you would have this centrifugal force right that's pulling that string taunt well you could actually do it with the potential strength of, of, of nanotubes the only problem is is they're so nano right you need more than one of them and as soon as you have to start bonding them you know you've got a it's the bond between the nanotubes that is the weak point as opposed to the bonds that are within the nanotubes if that makes sense so on that level, on that scale, just to stay in this, and viewers will indulge me because I will yeah. over geek on this, obviously, but there's, this kind of goes into my own background. I, I, I work in a field that allies to uh, material science. And so if you scaled that to that degree, what is the prohibitive factor aside from cost? Does that technology actually scale physically as a material to that level? Okay, so are you asking about the nanotube specifically? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so interesting is that it's, it's theoretically possible to take, to make a nanotube that's miles long and invisible, right? Because its diameter across goes back to being, you know, the diameter of a buckyball. So let's say the diameter's 10 buckyballs, right? And we already said, take a hair, a thousand of buckyballs will fit in there. So take one tenth of that right and that's the diameter of the nanotube and now again it could be miles long and if you coiled it up in your hand you would be able to see it right because it would just accumulate at some point 
but it's you know it would be an invisible wire, right? It's invisible. Oh, I can think of really nefarious things I could do with yeah. a material like that. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. This, mm. So moving moving from that, how do we get to the place where we begin to see the application of C60 in a whole different aspect as this super antioxidant? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it, here, it, so I started the company back uh, with Robert back in 1991. We're selling carbon nanomaterials. We're carbon nanomaterial scientists. It's been selling to the institutions around the world since then. Um, and in 2012, this study comes out. They actually purchased our material. Our material is the one that's mentioned in the actual peer reviewed published publication. And then in mid-2013, we start getting phone calls. And the phone calls are like, hi, uh, how much in a dose? And you, you it, 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 let me explain how weird that was for us. Because think of it, we're carbon nanomaterial manufacturers. Literally in our heads, we're answering the question by going, dose? What do you, like, it goes in paint and tires and batteries and solar cells. You don't put this in your body. Like, that's, what are you talking about? And this is, I mean, we're aware of the literature and we're aware of this, this infamous study, but in mid 2013, our kind of conservative nanomaterial scientist hats were like, not for human consumption. So we actually added not for human consumption to our labeling. And again, it was very clear, C60 improperly processed was harmful. And that's part of the reason we put not for human consumption. And what we call ESS60, that C60 that's been processed for safe for human consumption has a lot of good reports about it. So mid 2013, not for human consumption. It takes a really long time. You mentioned three weeks in a smaller batches. You can actually mix it in about two weeks. You just got, you have a lot more control of the vortex and the mixing and, and the, the resident residence points where uh, the ESX 60 might settle out and not get exposed to oils. But um, so, so we were, it's a long time, two weeks and the equipment necessary. So we were actually selling um, ESS 60 in olive oil. Uh, if you wanted to reproduce this, say you had a rat and you wanted to see if your rat could live twice as long, or you wanted maybe to try it on your dog or anything else you're going to try and do. We weren't, you know, we weren't aware of what's going on. Fast forward to 2017. So 2013 to 2017, we're selling the oil. Uh, a guy with a really big YouTube following, he talks about Bitcoins and he actually started talking. Yeah, we know who that is. He's been yes. on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi, Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and, and he starts talking about the benefits that he's getting and literally the industry exploded. Everybody ran out. Now, everybody except for us because we're the largest manufacturer and distributor of ESS-60 on the planet. We never really ran out. It was actually about the time of Harvey. So there was about three days we couldn't even get to our office and we had all these oil orders piling up and you know, we sent, sent them out. But, but, but we never ran out of that material. That was late in, in 2017. Yeah, uh, I, I remember this rumor mill that, and you know, here again, yeah. I have to address this. Yeah. That, that this whole spectrum of the C60 world is, is kind of like a microcosm of alternative media itself. It's rife with conspiracy theories and frankly, at times rigged science, bad science, pseudoscience yeah. and yeah. beyond that. Yeah. So yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So, so in 2018, here's, here's where I found myself, right? And it's an interesting situation because I think a, a typical supplement guy or gal becomes that one of two ways. And the first way, is, and probably the most predominant way, is a, somebody decides they're going to go get wealthy, so they decide they're going to be a supplement guy, and they go down that path. I have no mm -hmm. problem with people being wealthy, but that's just not how I ended up as a supplement guy. The other path is some people have their own kind of health problems, and I think Cliff would fall into this, and he was trying to find solutions yeah. for that. Or maybe it's a family member and you're solving these problems and you come up with a formulation and a process and a mindset and you decide that you want to save the world. You, it might not surprise you. I also have no problem with saving the world, but that's not how I ended up here. Basically, this material I've been manufacturing since 1991 and in 2012, they do this study and in 2018, orders are pouring in. So coming into 2018, we're like, what are we going to do with this? And for me, I've got two questions. One of them is a moral question. And I take the product myself. My wife takes the product. 
uh, everybody on my team takes a product, I am comfortable selling it to you. I believe that it's safe. And then the other one is illegal. It's the FTC and the FDA, and we're on the right side of both of those organizations. So 2018 is when we really started kind of putting together the processes and the concepts. And now here we are in 2019, uh, kind of towards the end, and launching C60 Evo. It's, it's a pretty exciting time for us. So have you been basically dominantly a supplier for other people manufacturing it, if you're free to say that? Yes. So okay. um, our estimates are that about 90% of the oil with C60, or and now it should start being changed as a label to ESS60, um, if you're actually going to put it in your body, uh, about 90% to, to, to the market. Now, one of the concerns, and this is this is kind of important to share, you're talking about this this industry already has i mean it's a new industry basically and already has all of this junk that's built up about it in 2018 we actually oversold our production in olive oil and we actually had to take all of our production of ess60 and put it into our own olive oil right so orders were coming in for our ess60 we weren't fulfilling those orders so we actually kind of searched around the globe to find a potential solution because it's pretty easy for us to if somebody else is making it we can buy it we can test it we've got all the equipment to test it here we've been testing it and delivering it to research institutions forever and so that would be pretty easy so we ended up visiting um really china is one of the main distributors uh there's a um there's an organization that is working on larger scale manufacturing in boston we have a partnership with them uh there's one of the preeminent fullerene scientists in canada um not only is a good friend but we're actually working with him uh, and when we visited really the the place that we could we thought we could get the enough volume was china now china has things that people are concerned about um, a history of kind of supplement challenges in the United States. So we were leery from the beginning uh, and, and really we tested their product. There were some things that we didn't like about the product. And so mm -hmm. instead of like buying their product and selling it, which wasn't, we weren't gonna do, uh, buying it and reprocessing it, which we could have done to make it safe. We just said, let's, let's forgo that. It's revenue that we're gonna lose, but uh, it'll be safer for uh, really the market in general. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're, we're the, the largest manufacturer and distributor of ESS 60 on the planet. Wow. That's, that's impressive. So talk to me a little bit about the, the oils themselves that the C60 is, is it correct to say that the C60 is suspended? It is a uh, suspended solution. All right. So, um, and, and thank you for allowing me this. It's ESS 60. Once we start putting ESS it in oil, 60, right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, want to be rude to the host and you offered. So thank no, you. No, no, um, we're, we're all coming into this. <laughs> You're like me. Like I, I don't, I, you know, when I go into something, I have like passionate and, and concrete ideas. And if the data says something else, like how right. quickly can I get rid of that idea? So um, ESS 60 does not go into different oils at the same rate, right? And I think there's manufacturers out there who maybe focus on MCT or avocado or some other oils. And if you think, if you, if you happen to have ever purchased those, if you think back about what was said in the process of that, in that sales process, how open were they about the significantly lower uh, ESS60 content in their oils? And in fact, maybe in their case, it's C60 contact, uh, content in their oils. It turns out that the kind of uh, upper end saturation rate for an MCT oil uh, is about 0.35 milligrams per milliliter. Right, explain and, uh, MCT oil, please, Chris. Sure. So MCT is a particular kind of long chain, um, uh, uh, what is it, lipid that often or kind of originally came from coconut oil. So you're taking okay. coconut oil and you're fractionating it. It turns right. out you can get it from a lot of different oils. In our case- That's the term I was looking for was fractionated, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you definitely want to, it's, it's one component. Um, and so uh, in, in fact, we've ended up with what turns out to be a really expensive oil, but here were our demands. And it's interesting, we started the search and say, hey, we want MCT oil and MCT can be made from palm oil and from coconut oil. So we're like, okay, well, we only want it from coconut oil. And so our list of potential vendors got really small already. And then we said, insisted that it be organic. And so that ends up to be a significantly more expensive oil uh, than, than olive oil. So 
even though in our case, like our product, uh, the, the MCT oil has less ESS60 in it, uh, it has the same price just because well, really it's a little bit more expensive for us to make, but we, we got, wanted to keep kind of a consistent price across the board. So it's important to note that MCT actually holds significantly less ESS60 than say olive oil or avocado oil. Our pref what we prefer people to buy because we're kind of scientists by pedigree is the research is on ESS60 in olive oil. So we recommend that you take ESS60 in olive oil. Some people don't like olive oil. Um, people have been asking for MCT oil. So we, we certainly provide Got that, that on our website. Yeah, because I have a friend who markets C60 in Europe. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she has addressed to me is the oils and the fact that the C60 itself is in fact opening up in the body, opening up the, the receptors. Uh, and effectively, some oils are not as friendly to our biology as others. Yep. Some oils, let's be honest, Mm -hmm. are subject to rancidity and shipment yep. they don't have they don't have long term storage capabilities and if i think in the case of you know certain oils that have been shipped in the past there's been concerns that these oils were basically being shipped to a manufacturer used and then being stored and held again so that the turnaround wasn't long enough yeah. so uh, these are you know kind of things that I wanted to bring up with you to just get your take on how sensitive you are to the market in terms of the oils themselves. Well, well, one thing that's important to share, and, and I'm glad you brought it up, is that um, we're aware of the delicacies of these oils, right? And so we actually do every aspect of, of our production is done here in-house. So we're making the raw fullerenes, separating the raw fullerenes, getting down to uh, C60, right? Again, mm -hmm. not necessarily safe for human consumption. Further processing that so it becomes ESS60. And then now we've got our uh, kind of, we'll say, our ingredient to go into the oils. Those oils are delivered to us here. Uh, they're delivered in drums and then we process those. And we've actually had to change our processing to, you know, often things scale differently. So a two week stir in a small Erlenmeyer flask isn't something that's necessary in a large, like you need to spin it more, and you need to mix it more in a larger vat. As soon as you're mixing it more, you can imagine you've got this vortex, that vortex tends to pull in air. And so if you're exposed to air, it's pulling in oxygen and potentially right, right, exactly. oil. In yeah. our case, we've got, um, we've got nitrogen, a nice buffer gas that keeps that oxygen out of there. So we don't have any problems with oxidation. Um, and then we actually bottle it and label it and ship it from here. And, uh, and, and we've just got great testimonials about how quick we ship, uh, what kind of customer service we have. You can actually make a phone call and talk to somebody. Like all of these things are, you know, kind of differentiators in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more rumor I want to dispel. <laughs> that Bring it on. The Carmen 60 has nanites in it. I think we brought nanites up in that original article, but I think what we were talking about there was how Carbon 60 basically opened the door to a science of nanotechnology as opposed to nanites or nanoparticles inside of, let's differentiate that, let's break yeah. that out. Well, yeah, so, so, you know, we get people who are concerned about the NSA monitoring us through, through these buckyballs. I mean, mm -hmm. this is very, very interesting, you know, similar to the, the fact that NASA bought out all the stock of C60. By the way, we didn't actually address that. No, they didn't. <laughs> um, and if they were going to buy all of the stock, then they really would have come to us. And we, although we've worked at NASA and been to NASA, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't visit us in that context. Additionally, we're making everything here. Um, I've never seen a guy with an NSA badge walk by here. Granted, they wouldn't have a badge, but it's a, we have a pretty small organization. There's no NSA people here. And even if there were, the, the reality is it's a buckyball. It's 10 angstroms across, right? So there's no room, there's no wiggle room to turn this into some sort of device or monitoring system. There's just no room for that. There's no way that that can happen. 
uh, for, on, on a physical scale. We, we're, we're able to, like with really expensive equipment, kind of move one silica atom at a time. And, and these are like newsworthy events when that happens. Uh, so to think about being able to some way manipulate this 60 carbon atom sphere so that it's, you know, collecting data or influencing you <laughs> is, is, doesn't really make sense. I, I got a pretty big tinfoil hat. That one was even kind of beyond me. And so, you know, but hey, we've, hey. we've considered, we've considered maybe we need to like have aluminum packaging. You know how like a McDonald's uh, uh, Happy Meal, you can cut up the box and turn it into something. We're like, well, we should have packaging so we can just turn it into an aluminum uh, tinfoil hat. That exactly. Goes, right? yeah. yeah. No, we don't need more aluminum. What we do need is more C60. Yes. And, um, yes. Who needs more C60? I mean, from our standpoint, we think everybody does. But I know um, some work's been done at universities. I know that there are people who are looking at this as an enhancer for athletes, for people who want to run at peak performance, for breaking off brain fog. Give us a little bit of what you can about the benefits, knowing that the FDA says we can't cure anything. Yes. Yeah, so the, so the, the, the actual FDA statement is the product has not been uh, evaluated by the FDA. It's not intended to treat, diagnose, and cure or prevent any disease. Um, all, all of the t kind of testimonials that I will ever share will be documented and you will be able to, like, we will be able to reference them. We know who they are. Uh, th these are, you know, actual bits of information that we're sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I got to tell you from, from 2018. So even, even as I'm going into 2018, I'm the skeptical scientist who now is a supplement guy. Right. So that's a very weird position to be in and peep PS. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I still take, I try to take about three calls a week of different customers as they're calling in back then I took a lot more and, and these people would call in and give these amazing testimonials. And, and I was just like, I don't know what to do with these testimonials. Like I don't, it, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, you're, you're, you, you, you let your pet out and the pet's mean to everyone and then it goes out and the people bringing your pet back are like, it's the nicest dog ever. Not that, my, <laughs> not that our product is mean to anyone, but you're like surprised, right? I, I remember giving bottles to friends and going, you know, okay. Is it good? hopefully it works because I don't it want won't to kill you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and then I'm just not concerned about that anymore. I'm still very excited that I, I actually bumped into a neighbor at a Halloween party. Your kids were going trick or treating last night, and um, and he was like, "Yeah, I just I just sleep a lot better. I've got more energy during the day, more mental acuity during the day, and uh, and and so it's a product that I'm going to keep taking for the rest of my life." And I'm not surprised anymore, but it still makes me feel really, really good, right? Um, the most consistent testimonial is really better sleep, right? Um, and and, and I, I'm really very much of a binary data guy, so I'm not going to just share with you, oh, I sleep better, right? It's when people give me very specific um, nuanced pieces of information that are like, okay, this person was aware of how they were before and how they are mm -hmm. after, right? So that I, that I yeah. believe them. For instance, I've got a business coach who said for 50 years prior to taking the C60 Evo formulation, I needed an alarm clock to wake up. And since I've been on that formulation, I'm waking up before the alarm clock, right? Those are, that's very binary. Right? Yeah, that is. That and is. I feel comfortable yeah. sharing that. There's another one, which is kind of in between, like where they were aware of it, they weren't. There was a, a lady in my office, she was next door, she's actually moved out of the office, and she was talking to me, she was going through some cancer treatments, and actually talked to me about how she wasn't in a financial position to afford all of her treatments, which makes me really unhappy, right? Yeah. So I gave her, and the reason I gave her a couple of bottles, um, there are some studies, now they're, they're in vivo, so petri dish studies, not in mm -hmm. anybody's bodies, where they have got you know healthy cells and cancer cells, and they're introducing ESS-60 into the situation, and the ESS-60 and also uh, um, anti-cancer drugs into the situation, and the presence of ESS-60 actually helps the anti-cancer drugs uh, uh, attack the cancer more, and also helps to protect the healthy cells. Again, in this in vitro 
uh, a situ in vivo, excuse me, situation. Uh, so I was like, here, you're going through this process, take these bottles. I saw her about five days later. And I was like, so, so how are you feeling? And she goes, well, I haven't really noticed anything. And, and the, the effects are a little subtle, so um, that doesn't surprise me. But I asked her, so how are you sleeping? And her eyes just like lit up. She goes, well, I've been posting on Facebook that I'm wait, waking up at 5.30 every morning. And you know, I, I used to not wake up until seven or I'd need an alarm clock to do it or whatever. And incidentally, she was in the military. So I think 5.30 is about revelry, revelry right? So that's, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. the, the, her, probably her quote unquote natural time to get up. And she just started getting up at her natural time uh, from the product. Now, I my current theory just theories, because how these things work are a lot of We know it's, an, it's a known antioxidant, 172 times more powerful than vitamin C. It's a known anti-inflammatory. The current kind of thought processes for aging are that it's an oxidation yeah. issue and an inflammation issue. So we're, yes. we know we're checking, checking two of those boxes. But because you're sleeping better, um, I read this book called Why We Sleep. I don't know if you've read it. It's, it's an amazing book. It's also one of the scariest books I've ever read because it goes in and it says, when you don't get enough sleep, here's what happens to your heart. Here's what happens to your blood sugar level, like your level of diabetes. Here's what, what happens to your memory. And you can imagine none of it's good, right? And there's nothing good about not getting enough sleep. And I really think that um, if all it's doing is helping you sleep, then that can explain all the other testimonials that we're getting, right? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And what's really interesting about this as a potential sleep aid is most sleep aids, by the way, the book, uh, um, Why We Sleep, mentioned that the sleep aid industry is a $2 billion industry. And most of the sleep aids, we're kind of familiar with Ambien. It's a, it's a drug mm -hmm. that you take right before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And what it does do is it, is, and it gets into a lot more detail in the book, but it relaxes the chemical pressure for you to sleep, right? So you may be out and out is probably the right word, you may be out for eight hours and the chemical pressure that your body uses to signal to you to go get some sleep is released, but you don't get any in REM or REM sleep. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so, so you're not sleepy, but you also aren't healing. I don't even know this, the Guinness Book of World Records has outlawed attempts to stay awake the longest because it will literally kill you. Well, this was part of, you know, a current theme, uh, a big theme that we talk about is a lot is mind control. One yeah. of the greatest forms of mind control is sleep deprivation. Well, yes. And yet in Western culture, we do it to ourselves, yeah. you know, yeah. because of the ubiquity of light devices and the computers and the phones, which the blue light is disrupting our, our, our natural cycles. Melatonin, and on yeah. top of it, this high energy environment that we live in, it's buzzing with all these frequencies. And so as a culture, we're sleep deprived. Yeah. And when you're taking Ambien or other drugs, your natural progression cycle is going into sleep. Or it's the difference between floating on a parachute and being dropped into a gully. Right, right. In terms of how you, you go into sleep. Yeah, yeah. Both situations, yeah. you do end up at the bottom, but, yeah. but one of them is good for you and one and of them I know this not. because I am, uh, and I, I've, I've dealt with insomnia. I've dealt with the health side effects of that. You know, for me, the C60 journey was largely me trying to find things to deal with my own health issues. Right. So it, it's a very pro progressive kind of thing for everybody. It's different. And, 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 and I'm assuming it has impacted your sleep? Yes, yes, there's a marked difference, I must say. Um, I went back on the C60, uh, you were ESS60. ESS60. <laughs> well, the let's just, ESS60. Let's just call it C60 Evo now, right? And I have to say that my sleep has gone back into a really nice, sweet zone. I'm not oversleeping, yep. but I'm not wide-eyed insomniac either. Like the so Radiohead song. My <laughs> testimonial for sleep is, this is the thing I've noticed, because I've been a good sleeper. Like I, I, I wouldn't say that I've had any problems, but there are, are certainly times where I've taken, I don't know if you're familiar with Valerian. Valerian kind of quiets your mind, right? So mm -hmm. when you're going to bed and you're thinking about 10. It's a root, right? Yes, it's a root. Yes. And, and it'll quiet your mind. It, it does will. a good job. So, so after I've, I've been taking this formulation, 
I remember going to bed and literally thinking, I shouldn't even bother going to bed because there's no way I'm going to go to sleep. I got 10, 20 things spinning around in my head. This is going to be a waste of time. And then my pe- bed head hits the pillow and I'm, and I'm out, right? And so what's interesting about that is it's not slowing you down. It's almost the, it's like keeping you in the right state. And then when you're in the right state, like horizontal, right? Let, you're going to sleep. This is also the only, so most sleep, quote unquote, is the right way to say it. Sleep aids will knock you out. Our product, you actually take it in the morning. Most of our customers take it in the morning. Some of them say, oh, if I take it late at night, it might keep me up. That's not true for me, but probably about, I don't know, 25% of our customers say that. So we really recommend you take it in the morning. What sleep aid do you take in the morning, feel good energy and focus during the day, and then sleep well that night. Yeah, it's, it's doing something very different. And I, I have to be honest, we don't know exactly what it is. It's I think it's related to the fact that it's such a strong antioxidant, such a great anti-inflammatory, and so it's kind of keeping your body in a cleaner state. So when you hit the sack and you're you're getting that sleep, it's able to skip some of the cleaning processes and get right to other processes that are at, of value to you. Exactly. Yeah, the body goes through all these processes. It's a reset. It's basically a way to return it back to its natural balance. Yeah. Um, what is the dose on the ESS sixty? Yeah. So, so the t- yeah, you got it. Boom. <laughs> so the the in reality, we don't know. So I did actually an allometric calculation from the original rat study and to, to bring it into humans. So we know that rats and humans have totally different metabolic states, right? They're, mm-hmm. they, they operate differently. Um, and, 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 and it's often the case that studies that start in rats end up in humans and you have to make some sort of adjustment. That's called an allometric adjustment. Sure. I find this, you'll find this, your, your geekiness will find this fascinating. What they did is they actually um, equate uh, surface area of the animal to metabolism, right? So you're really taking the surface area of a rat. This sounds so engineering, right? <laughs> Imagine the surface area of the rat and the surface area of the human. Yeah. That's a representation of their uh, metabolic rate. And then now we can do this calculation. Because actually, if we had just done a per kilogram calculation, the typical dose would be one uh, cup of olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> not something well mm. we certainly know it would have a cleansing effect right right yes, yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so so we did this allometric calculation it it really landed right at about five mils so we kind of let's let's go with five mils we've got some customers who are taking less we've got some customers who take more i take about seven and a half mils right so that's for for it's a teaspoon and a half um, okay. In the morning. That's, that's, that's kind of where I was going with it. Yeah. And, and when I'm, when I know I'm going to have a busy day being like really mentally exhausted, I've got to do a lot of allometric calculations that day. <laughs> I'll take <laughs> it dose. Um, and, and, and it really, really gets me through. I can tell you uh, there are most of the days if I get into the afternoon and I'm starting to feel like I'm yawning and I feel like maybe I need a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Those are the days that I can look back and know that I, that I just didn't take my dose in the morning. Okay, interesting. There's a lot more we could talk about, but you've been generous with your time. You have a company to run, you've got customers to talk to, and you got to keep stirring those vats. So <laughs> I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, again, the website right behind you there. Yeah, C60, C60 Evo. Evo. Dot com. And, and we've is, got a coupon for any of your listeners. If they're yep. listening, they can get a 5% coupon. I don't know if you want to share that or. I, I, I yeah, no, we'll put that link up. We'll share it out. We'll tweet it, Facebook it, Instagram it. Just put it all over the place. And we're giving you a little bit of credit so that if anybody's ever wanted to kind of understand how to, how to support the show, then, then there you go. There you go. Support us, support yourself. Yeah. Um, this really is a journey back towards uh, health or you know, maybe cranking that performance level up another notch or so. We, we could talk about that another time because a yeah, you know, couple good testimonies. And, and one of them is like a very, bi- for me, very binary, like 
he kept track of his time until he failed and then he got on the product and was able to like extend it by at least 40 percent off to look up re, re, double check the number nice somebody that keeps data gotta love that yes all right all right chris verse the product c60 evo and e ss60 the new generation of carbon thanks for coming on chris I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. This is Off Planet Radio.